debate about difficult, challenging, and even grievous questions that face our students and our society is our mission here at Redlands, one that we characterize as educating the heart and mind as we empower our students. Thank you Stephen, for coming out. I'd like to also thank uh, our host, the University of Redlands, and Provost Kathy Ogren for having us. We really value this partnership. And we've been planning an event for some time. For what I think is going to be a very important conversation, probably the closest that we've done to what we're doing tonight was back after the September 11th, 2001 attacks in New York. Air Talk on the Road. Injured. The Inland Regional Center isn't scheduled to reopen for a few more weeks. The investigation is continuing into the planning and motivation of the mass shooting by San Bernardino County Restaurant Inspector Saeed Rizwan Farouk and his wife Tashfeen Malik. We might be familiar to you as you've watched coverage out of San Bernardino, Jared Bergwan, who is also an alumnus of the University of Redlands. Chief, thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. I assume that chiefs like yourself envision the worst possible scenario, that that's part of... So as, they, as they start their career and they, you know, they get their training, they get their academy training, they get their in-house training, they get their field training, um, they take that training and they take every experience that they have on the job and they kind of self-evaluate how they really do it better. And I think what everybody also does, uh, at least I can speak for myself, is that you know we've all seen things that have been nationwide news or international news, um, terrorist events or mass shootings or whatever they might be, and you watch the local response and you, uh, you know, you, you go through some thing in your head that talks about, well, what would you do? How would, how would you handle that? Yeah. Yeah, and so has it? Um, as well as all of our partners, we have we have law enforcement from throughout the region that responded, and, and obviously fire departments and paramedics and emergency medical folks that responded. I, I think I can speak in general to say that um, police officers kind of go into autopilot when they're there and doing what needs to be done. Uh, it's the after part that becomes difficult to deal with. So internally, um, we provide a number of services. So I think those kind of connections were, uh, are everywhere and they're still, um, still coming forward. Uh, certainly, I, I think people are, are looking to their churches and they're joining vigils to, um, as a, a sort of a structure. And live in this county or work in this county. 24 hours after the attack, um, you know, we, we are, our hearts were broken and our prayers are with um, the, the, the victims and their families. We held a prayer vigil. Uh, we thought that would be our the most appropriate first step. Um, we've been in the county for so long. I went to public schools there. I lived my entire, you know, life there. And um, I, to, to hear and to see it live, um, the, the events unfolding, I was glued to my television. Um, I teach at UCLA Law School. I, I was putting aside my academic work and, um, and just thinking about what I was seeing, and and immediately that evening we held a prayer vigil. We had three individuals, heroic individuals who who were who were there on the ground battling this attack uh, with us, and we we just had a simple message that the the power of prayer and healing is something that our uh, spiritual leader, His Holiness Mir Samasur Ahmed, who is a spiritual leader of tens of millions of Ambi Muslims teaches us every Friday the power of prayer can start the process of healing and we are there and, and the message that I gave was as, as a, a Muslim community that is sorely persecuted ourselves, uh, 86 members of our community were gunned down by the Taliban who trained Sassu Shazad to blow up Times Square. We know that America's enemies are our community's enemies. Many of our community members have immigrated from Pakistan fleeing persecution. Pakistani origin, the same origin shared by by these terrorists. Did, did that make it even harder? I mean, are, are, are many of the people that worship at your mosque particularly angry at the killers because of that? 
There is, there is an intense frustration, and when we found out of the origins and then the linkage, potential linkage here to ISIS, our entire DNA as a community is fighting extremism in the name of Islam. And when we saw this happen, of course, the, the reaction of American Muslims is, we are community members, we are enmeshed in the fabric of this county. So we are going to react as anyone else would. We are there in the memory of, of those who have fallen. We will act to defeat this perverse ideology. But doubly so, as American Muslims, we need to shoulder, perhaps fairly or unfairly, a greater burden, not just to being vigilant or being angry, but translating that into an action plan to deal with the root causes. And a little bit later in the hour, I want to talk with you more about that. This kind of, if you want to call it radicalism or perversion, hits one's own community and one is not only affected with respect to those who are victimized, uh, but also uh, having someone who is a part of our community be the perpetrator uh, is a terrible thing. And several weeks ago I was in Washington, I went to Washington twice in the last month, uh, and I was testifying before Congress about the risks uh, of terrorism to the United States, and in particular, one of the ones that he addressed was the South the jihadist risk from organizations like ISIS. And at the same time I was there talking about that risk, uh, there was someone from our own community uh, plotting to attack us. So that's uh, extraordinarily chilling. Yeah. I think that's part of everybody's human process. I think everybody goes, goes through or does that in their own way. We're going to where they're, they're, it's a little bit on edge, you know, going out to, you know, Sprouts Market and kind of being looked at a certain way. Um, uh, putting, I, I, I heard a story of, of a woman who was wearing a headscarf, putting groceries in her car, and someone reported that she was opening the trunk, and then that caused a, a, a scan of her car, and then a scan of her, you know, a search of her home. So. There are some, there is a sense of uneasiness as well, and our community is very vigilant that way. So, so you know, we have to balance everything. I think on balance, there's a tremendous resilience in this county, and and the, and the backlash is, is minimal in that in that way. But at the same time, because of such a national conversation and some very fiery rhetoric rhetoric from from political candidates, it becomes a conversation where it really puts our community in a bad spot. I'm John Khan, just to reintroduce the leader of San Bernardino County's largest mosque, Basu al Hamid Mosque in Chino. Um, I think you were on with me when we had a woman call in who said she no longer covers, she doesn't wear the headscarf, she doesn't. And I was wondering, have you seen that? I don't know what percentage of your congregants of the women cover or not. Any of them thinking of changing that out of fear about being out publicly and being covered? 100% of our congregation wears the headscarf, and none of them feel that way. Um, I, I think that the, 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 the point about identity, about preserving your identity and wearing the headscarf, a quintessential religious right, uh, an aspect of religious freedom that's an inescapable part of our First Amendment, if, 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 if Muslim women abandon that, we feel they're abandoning the, the most important right that we have in this country, and we are sending a bad signal to those who would pervert our faith. The First Amendment, I often tell people that the U.S. Constitution is more Islamic than the constitutions of many Muslim governments. Mm -hmm. Our country, the United States, we are more free to practice our faith as American Muslims than anywhere else in the world. I believe that. I believe when the President says that. So we can't abandon our, our right to wear religious garb that identifies us as Muslims. It's a quintessential part of who we are. We will not cower in our homes or in the supermarkets and take off our headscarf because that is who we are and we are partners in this common war against a perverse uh, view of our faith. And I just want to clarify, I assume you're saying she shouldn't stop covering out of fear. I just want to. That's precisely right. Yeah, That's I just want to clarify right. that that point. And I also want to give you. We only have a couple minutes left. But what your community and what you think other American Muslim communities can do to try and counteract um, the United States in the Oval Office sent sent a very important message. It was a message that we should condemn Islamophobia 
but that there is a challenge. You can give a challenge to the American Muslim community to, to zero in on a militant ideology that is, that is perverting your faith and to take measures to stop it. And this is not a challenge that is new by this president. This first address to the Muslim world in Cairo in 2009, he said the same thing. He said it in the White House summit, our community, the Amity Muslim community was invited to that, that what are American Muslims doing? And we have several things we're doing. We have to stop the crisis uh, campaign, crisis with the play on words on ISIS, across all universities nationally, where we are discussing very specific steps to counter the propaganda of ISIS. We have a true Islam campaign that we're about to launch, which basically sets the record straight on what Islam stands for, and those values are compatible, compatible with America. And, and we also have, we have a blood drive, a Muslims for Life blood drive campaign this Sunday. We have a, a blood drive at our mosque open to everyone, where we say the only blood that Muslims should shed is to save lives, not to take lives. And these are the kinds of messages that will isolate and marginalize extreme views. Yeah.